gentleman, the Honorable Al Gore. Al, come on up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Welcome to Web2. Thank you very much. Where do you want me to speak from, so the you podium? Speak from here and then 15 minutes. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wow, that's an unexpected uh, welcome. Really, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, some week. Some week. Each of you uh, could probably share personal stories about what got you the most <laughs> emotionally. I'm going to resist the temptation because I got a long list. <laughs> really, it, it, it really uh, was overwhelming. And I know you've had some discussion here already about uh, the meaning of it all in connection, how it relates to to this gathering and um, couldn't have happened without the World Wide Web, without the internet. And the fundraising dimension of it was only part of it. Uh, I talked to a friend who was involved in sort of the traditional get out the vote activities. And he was uh, in a city where uh, 10,000 young people gathered Mostly young, not, not, not all young, but you get into a hab the habit of saying that. But. And so they showed up. They didn't put anything in the warehouse except some printers. And people came with their cell phones, and they used up every square inch of the floor, floor space on the concrete floor, and then spilled out into the parking lot. And they were using their own cell phones following the, uh, the printed uh, list of names and getting the information that was relevant. And I know you had some earlier presentations about how the, uh, <clears throat> the new possibilities uh, in, on the web have revolutionized uh, almost every aspect of running for president. And the, the electrifying redemption of America's revolutionary declaration that all human beings are created equal would not have been possible. <laughs> would not have been possible without the, the additional empowerment of individuals to use knowledge as a source of power that has come with the internet. Um, I'm getting, I, I don't have much time, and I, I wanted to acknowledge John Battelle and thank him for uh, all that he does, and Tim O'Reilly, and I want to, uh, likewise, and I want to acknowledge uh, my partner and co founder of uh, Current, uh, now Current Media, Current TV, Current.com, Joel Hyatt, and uh, Joanna Drake Earl, our uh, superstar COO, and uh, I want to say a, a, few, a few more words about the election. I want to say a few words about why I feel it's so important. I know Joel talked earlier here, but I want to say a few words about why I think it's so important to democratize the television medium. And then uh, in the remaining three or four minutes, uh, I, I want to uh, talk about how to use Web 2.0 for uh, organizing a, an imminent uh, rescue of the Earth's climate balance, which uh, is now in, in great jeopardy. Um, so what happened in the election opens up a full new range of possibilities. And now is the time to really move uh, swiftly to use these new possibilities. 
uh, to, to, to exploit these new possibilities. I'm trying to work, avoid the word exploit, I guess. But um, I made a talk earlier today about how the early invention, the, 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 the early uses of electricity 100 years ago uh, were aimed at sort of specialized applications and gimmicks and doodads and whiz bangs that demonstrated the special qualities of this new conveyor of power. And how now we just take electricity for granted, it's everywhere, and it has empowered a whole civilization. And I tried to use an analogy between the, that evolutionary path and uh, Web 2.0, or the World Wide Web. When people are displaying interactivity or user-generated content or social networking or whatever, that's kind of the gee whiz stuff. I'm not uh, trying to diminish that at all, but I am saying that I think that our challenge, really, those of us who are excited about the speedier development of the full potential that we have here, we need to move past that as quickly as possible to a time where all of those features are just taken for granted and are just like uh, the fish, the, the water the fish doesn't know it's swimming in. And how do we get there? And I think that um, the incredible explosion of uh, new ways of collaborating, uh, securing information, if you want to talk about that, of, of introducing new levels of creativity uh, and quality into everything that's done. I want to use a quick story that some business schools uh, use about the first invention of the electric dynamo back to the early days of electricity. Some of you know this story. But there was, a, there, was, there, there was a clear demonstration that this new electric motor that they call the dynamo at that time was much more efficient than the older water wheel steam sources of energy. And so some of the early adopters put them in their factories and waited for the results. And there was no uh, extra productivity at all. And after a few decades, uh, th the retroactive analysis pretty much settled on the following explanation, that the architecture of these factories had been optimized for the, the, the water power or the steam power. And they would often be vertical and tall and fan belts coming off on different levels. And, and, and so the potential for the dynamo wasn't unleashed until these old factories were depreciated and replaced with new ones low and flat to the ground where the dynamos could be co-located with every location that needed work performed, that needed the energy delivered directly to where it could most efficiently and productively be used. And then there was an incredible explosion of productivity. And I was thinking about that empty warehouse with people sitting on the concrete floor using cell phones, and they'd gotten there because of the internet, and the lists were kept on the internet, and yet soon there will be a new design for that warehouse, for the activity that took place in that in that warehouse. And as this year's Web 2.0 conference has focused on what, on the purposes to which these new capacities can be put, I do think that it's worth looking at the, the advantages of redesigning and re-architecting the context within which the activities take place. In other words, World 2.0, so that when there are changes that are needed, there's no timidity about going out and trying to make them happen. Now, you know, I'm a recovering politician, and I, I said I was going to talk a little bit more about that. I do think that the, one of the main reasons why our political system has, been, uh, has not been operating very well until this election 
is the deadening influence of the television medium as it has been operating. And w without giving you the, the full song and dance here, I, I believe very deeply, uh, first of all, I believe in the idea of information ecosystems, media ecosystems. And uh, 500 years ago, the introduction of the printing press revolutionized the public sphere. Prior to that time, for the thousand years between the fall of Rome and, and uh, the midway through the Renaissance, there was a monopoly or an oligopoly of information with the, the church, the medieval church, and the, the feudal system, the monarchy, and all power, economic, political, spiritual, was sort of uh, con concentrated. And 99% of the people were illiterate. Libraries were 20 books chained to a desk, uh, uh, intermediated by the experts, etc. So when the printing press broke that up, in only a few decades, everything changed. And then it, the change began to pick up speed. And individuals were empowered to use knowledge as a source of influence and power. And a new information ecosystem developed that uh, allowed anyone who could learn to read and write, and most people can do that in two weeks, and by the millions, uh, and this is European-centric, so forgive me, but uh, it did influence the rest of the world. And then um, all of a sudden people said, well, wait a minute. Uh, the, king, uh, the kings and queens and the medieval church, that's not the source of authority. We have a new sovereign, the rule of reason, because we can connect with one another, search out the best available evidence crowdsource uh, what seems to be more likely than not a true version of what we're trying to figure out and then make a, a decision about it. And then that matured into the American Constitution, which was a miracle and a breakthrough. And as I said earlier, it's belated redemption <clears throat> of one of its central propositions is what we're celebrating, part of what we're celebrating this week. Okay, so 50 years ago, television <clears throat> preceded by radio, refutalized the dominant source of information in society. Reconcentrated it, refutalized it, made it vulnerable. And the last presentation showed you the model of how easy it is in, in, in China to control that kind of model. Well, you know, it's very different here, but uh, interesting parallels at, at times. So the internet comes in and, and democratizes information again, and it's so thrilling and so exciting, and it's not an accident that all the reform movements and all the vibrant new movements for change are, are living on the internet. But television, in its traditional manifestations, have still been dampening it. So Joel Hyde and I said, hey, wait a minute. How about we connect the internet to the television medium and use the democratizing features of the internet coupled with the exciting new low-cost, high-quality personal video uh, capacity and invite people to make their own television and to select their own television and filter it and edit it and so forth. And so that's what current TV is all about. And we just this week have combined with Twitter and Dig and we had, I hope some of you saw the election coverage and the Hack the Debate features that we've had. And we're having a lot of fun and I hope that you'll go to to current.com and also watch the, uh, the channel on television. Okay, now finally. <clears throat> One time, my wife Tipper and I um, got a puppy, much in the news this week because the president-elect, <laughs> it made me think about the first time we got a, a puppy for our then young children. And I was a newspaper reporter at the time, and one of the women that worked at the Nashville Tennessean was a dog trainer in her spare time. So we asked her to come out to our farm and give us some advice. So she sits us down, and her first question is, okay, what is the puppy's purpose? I said, it's a puppy. Its purpose is to be a puppy. No, 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 she said. You want to train this puppy? What's it going to be? Is it going to be a watchdog? Is it going to play with the kids? Is it going to get the newspaper in the morning? Is it going to guide? What's the purpose? So we had to really think about it. And then she said something that really stuck with me. 
She said, in sort of, you know, a, an official way, she said, a puppy has to have a purpose. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think that Web 2.0 has to have a purpose. We have to have a purpose. The purpose I would urge all of you, as many of you are willing to take it up, is to bring about a higher level of consciousness about our relationship to this planet and the imminent danger and opportunity that we face because of the radical transformation of the relationship between human beings and the Earth. We have everything that we need to save it and in the process create millions of new jobs, reduce our national security exposure to a sudden cutoff of foreign oil, and solve the climate crisis. But just as Barack Obama's election would have been impossible without the new dialogue and new ways of, of interacting on uh, the, the web, the only way this is going to be solved is by addressing the democracy crisis, which, uh, and, and we, we hit a, the country hit a great blow uh, in, uh, for victory uh, this week, but we have to take this issue and, and raise it in the awareness of everyone. And, and, and the solutions. Anyway, um, that's what I wanted to say. I'm looking forward to the interactions, and thank you very much for having me here. Come on out, and we'll, we'll do the interaction. Thank you. I brought you a, I brought you a, I brought you a cow. Thank you. <laughs> you know, right there. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll give it a start. Now that we understand it. Web 2 is a puppy, <laughs> which I think is a great analogy. Yeah, we, we my need kids a purpose. Have been all over me about getting a puppy, and now I have a feeling we're we're kind of stuck with the puppy as long as it has a purpose. Um, do you worry about this movement losing steam? I mean, we're, everyone's so excited, right? But you you may have in your career seen that before. <clears throat> well, it's interesting in light of the analogy I used earlier that you used the metaphor of, of losing steam. No, I, I'm not. I'm not. I think that it is very much in its infancy, barely beginning. And um, I think that we are not many years away from television sort of sinking into the digital world uh, and becoming a part of it. You know, McLuhan wrote 40 years ago, the content of the new media is the old media. And I think, I think we're seeing that. And I think that the social activism that is made possible by these new tools is just beginning to take off. So, but still, there's, a, there's an interesting question. I mean, right now, with the financial crisis, big realignment of, of priorities, you know, is there a danger? that the latest, uh, you know, give us this day our daily devil, you know, we now have this new problem that everybody's, you know, afraid of, and will, for example, climate change, you know, sink into the background. Uh, will, given that, that we've got a, a ticking clock, uh, do we lose time because of what's now front and center? I don't think that's going to be the dominant relationship between the climate crisis and the economic crisis. Uh, I've heard some people say that. I've heard more people say that actually the, the solutions to the climate crisis offer an ideal way to solve the economic crisis. Now, the economic crisis has two parts. There's a credit crisis that they're still wrestling with, and they'll get that solved. But the synchronized global recession, and that's what this is, is, uh, is, a, is a tougher problem to solve because when, you know, there's a slow down here, slow down there, it kind of feeds on itself. So economists really across the spectrum, including Martin Feldstein, Larry Summers, um, et cetera, et cetera, are, are left, right, and center are saying the ideal way to stimulate the economy towards sustainable growth now is with a large infrastructure program right. so it's a that puts people to work in jobs that can't be uh, outsourced. So we need to build an electronet. We need to build a unified national smart grid that has two sets of characteristics. Number one the new high voltage, low loss, buried underground uh, 
uh, lines that deliver renewable electricity from the southwestern deserts where the solar plants are going to be built and from the, the mountain corridor from Texas to the Dakotas where the wind power is going to be generated and the, the geothermal hot spots where the advanced new facilities there will generate it. And th it has to be taken from those places to the cities where it's mostly burnt. We also need immediately a national retrofit program to insulate homes, install the new windows and light bulbs. 40% of the, of the CO2 emissions in the U.S. come from buildings. And when you, when you spend the money to fix the buildings and reduce the CO2 emissions, you save the homeowner money. Here we have a, a pending debate on a national home mortgage backstop program, because the bailout didn't do that, and it needs to be coupled with this retrofit program. We can create 10 million new jobs very, very quickly. Now, we also have to have the, you know, increased incentives to so build the solar wind, uh, et cetera, and we need to electrify the, the, the automobile fleet yeah. so it becomes a massively distributed yeah, we battery. Had, we had Shai Agassi talking about that earlier. But I wanted just to uh, ask you, though, is there another issue here? In one sense, as we get out of this crisis, everybody sort of thinks it means getting back to the way it was before. And there's a question about whether, in fact, we need to think about lifestyle changes that are you know, more profound. Michael Pollan was here this morning yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, talking about that. You know, do we come out of this different in, in, in some more profound way? Absolutely. That's why I you know, volunteered the phrase World 2.0, although we're probably on World 3087.0. But, <laughs> right. but yeah. um, and, and Michael is a, is a great example of someone who's really thought clearly about the the changes in agriculture and food and land use. Yeah. And um, you know, 20 to 25 percent of the global CO2 emissions every year come from deforestation and burning of forests. Yeah. And, and a lot of that is connected to the nutty global agricultural trends, not all. Uh, and four times as much carbon is stored in the soil as in the trees. And so the, the, uh, the fertilizer and pesticide intensive uh, monoculture, agriculture is, is, is ho horrible for this. It can be replaced, needs to be replaced. So no, we're not, we need to move forward. And what I was trying to say earlier with the analogy to the dynamo and the, yeah. and the design of the factories is that as we do this, we're, we're, we're going to have to make design changes, transportation systems, for example, cities. If you look at all of the built environment that has been created since the first cities appeared in 9,000, years ago, that much urban built environment is, is predicted to be created in the next 40 years. And so the way it's designed, the way it uh, relates to transportation and communications and food and water uh, is really crucial. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a few questions, so please come up to the mics. I, I, I want to ask sort of a two-part question, and it has to do with a, an inconvenient truth, the, you know, monster keynote presentation that you did that people started noticing um, it was a joke. Um, <laughs> what, where was the joke? Well, <laughs> <laughs> finally, someone calls me out and it's Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you know, <laughs> what, what, you, what you did um, was communicate something urgent using, you know, an extraordinary set of tools, including the film itself, the presentation certainly, and you're sort of barnstorming around giving that presentation, mm -hmm. then the documentary, which really caught fire. It strikes me that all the things that you're talking about, many of the things that we've heard over the last three years, uh, th three days, it felt like three years, um, need another film, a, a sequel that envisions the things you're talking about, shows them and makes them apparent to the world. Mm -hmm. so my question to you is, will you make that film? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so let's get Lawrence I mean, back know. involved. We, <laughs> I, I, which film is that now? Well, uh -huh. Just, you know, all the things you're saying, it strikes me people need to understand and see. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and they're out there in the future, and, and, and people, it's kind of fuzzy, and people kind of get that they need to fix the world, but that's someone else's problem. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and to see that and understand what you can do about it would be, uh, I think, a great sequel. Mm. So we have questions. We have yeah. a lot of questions. Are we, are we moving urgently enough? That's the other question I really have. You know, it's like 
what's the target? James Hansen just came out recently and said the target, the car, CO2 target really ought to be 350, and we're yeah. already at 384. That's like way, way more aggressive than yeah. we were hearing even a few years ago. Are we moving fast enough? I mean, <laughs> no, no. No, but I mean, even in our proposals, are we moving fast enough? No. So, I mean, the proposals on the table are still too little. Well, I have a proposal on the table that I think is of the right magnitude, and I'm, ser I'm just deadly serious about it. I think that uh, the president-elect should announce uh, in January, when he becomes president, a national goal of getting 100 percent of America's electricity from renewable and non-carbon sources within 10 years. We can do that. So let me, let me, the, the declaration by President John F. Kennedy uh, that we would land a man on the moon and bring him back safely within t 10 years was felt by many at the time to be impossible. But eight years and two months later, Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And in Houston, in the control room, the systems engineers who were cheering that moment at an average age of 26, which means that when President Kennedy issued his challenge, they had an average age of 18. The young people who have been inspired. That just sent a chill down my back. <laughs> well, uh, keep that, because because we need to we need to we need exactly that. We need exactly that all over this country, and these young people that have been so inspired by uh, Barack Obama's campaign and the movement that, that uh, powered Barack Obama's campaign want a purpose. And one quick fact, North Polar Ice Cap, three million years it's been there, give or take. Average size, 47 of the four, lower 48 states, big. Long time. 75 to 80 percent chance that during the summer months it will be completely and totally gone in five years. This is an apocalyptic signal from the planet itself that we have so radically altered the relationship between our species and the planet that we are now in danger of wildly disrupting the, the context for human civilization. The location of every city, every town, every farm, every ranch, every port has been premised since the beginning of, since the beginning of urban civilization 10,000 years ago, after the last ice age, has been premised on a particular climate pattern that has been in equilibrium for all that time. We are now poised to completely disrupt it and in the process threaten the basis for human civilization. People hear these things, and there are many other similar signals, and then the next day, it's gone. Now, there, the neuroscientists have explanations for why that is, and, <laughs> you know, we're geared to, the urgency center of the brain is geared to snakes and spiders and fire and the things that evolution uh, posed as tests to our species. But when we have to use our neocortex to connect dots in an abstract pattern and then push that down to the urgency and fear center, that's just a little footpath. It's, an, it's like the internet, it's an, uh, mostly. It's an asynchronous uh, connection. There's a big connection going from the fear center to the reasoning process, but just a very small pathway uh, coming, coming back. It needs to be stored in the cloud. It's the aggregate bandwidth that counts. We need to have the truth, the inconvenient truth, forgive me, of this of this challenge stored uh, uh, in, in the cloud so that people don't have to rely on that process and so we can uh, respond to it collectively. You have just... <laughs> Who knew that you were the guru of Web 2.0 as well as global warming? I mean, you totally... You know, uh, sort of outlined our premise here. I know. Thank you for wrapping the entire conference up in a bow. Over here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Craig Kaplan, uh, CEO of Predict Wall Street. 
Uh, I've got a question. Uh, sometimes it's been said that uh, harnessing collective intelligence is the heart of Web 2.0. And you gave an example earlier in the Obama campaign of the warehouse and the internet got everybody there. I wonder if you could share any thoughts about uh, ways to harness collective intelligence to solve problems like global warming or some of these worldwide problems. I don't know if you've done anything along those lines. Well, when uh, the CPU was replaced or um, largely replaced in the high-end applications by the, uh, the massively parallel uh, architecture, the key was the sophistication of the, the program that gave the start-stop orders that collated the data. The inherent efficiencies were, were obvious, and they've only grown as Moore's Law has had a, a little more leverage on that particular architecture than, than others. And, and I think that um, you could draw an analogy between that process and the advances of human civilization. When we have really had these great leaps forward, has been when new information ecosystems have made it possible for individuals who are, who, who are thinking and processing information and who have you know, aspirations and hopes are able to connect easily with lots of others around core ideas. The, the print revolution did that. You know, the, as I said earlier, the, 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 the installation of a new sovereign, the rule of reason, uh, and the, um, the emergence of a, a marketplace of ideas that was accessible to individuals, that really empowered this kind of collective intelligence. And uh, the American Constitution could be, a, 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 by analogy, a, a brilliant piece of software that regularly harvests the, uh, the results of that. I mean, one of the reasons we're all thrilled uh, uh, this Tuesday night is, it was really obvious, this is a collective, <laughs> collectively intelligent decision. I mean, I saw conservative, Republican, right-wing folks on TV being interviewed saying, I'm so proud of my country. You know, they didn't vote for Obama, but they, under, they recognized the collective decision as being, yeah, wow. And uh, I, I think that we've gone through this, um, this uh, valley of television and are now coming out the other side to where, once again, people can connect and, uh, and do this. But it's, now, what's the, so, what's the analogy to the software here? There was a major cottage industry a couple decades ago about new business management techniques, and they were basically massively parallel in, in design. But they all had a kind of a similar answer to your question. You gotta start with a vision that is compelling enough that all of the individuals you want to participate in your collective enterprise feel motivated by. Secondly, you've got to have a shared set of values, not because it's nice to have values, although it is, but, but you've gotta have a shared set of values that can serve as the basis for decision making on the fly by any one of the individuals who are part of your smart crowd. And if everybody is pursuing the same vision, roughly, and is making decisions independently on the basis of the same values, then you're gonna get an intelligent uh, organization. You're gonna get a learning organization. Then you have to have a means of communicating about the most important goals ranked in order of significance and temporality or urgency uh, so that people roughly know, okay, what are we going to do, what are some of us going to do now and others of us are going to do next. Uh, and um, then you've got to maintain the health of that information ecosystem. That'd be the way I'd try to answer your question. Great, thank you. I think we have time for Oh, come on. We, we, uh, well, well, if you're, to, if, you're if, if you're good for more questions, uh, I'm. I think we. I don't think anybody's in a hurry to leave. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's Jesse Powell. First, it's, a, it's an honor to have you here. Um, I've kind of been struggling with this question for a while myself. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, and you know, 
I'm just wondering, as someone who's, who's worn both hats, whether you think more good can be done serving the public sort of as a, you know, in a, in a public office or as an entrepreneur employing people and, and sort of changing the world, um, you know, that way. Oh, it's a great question, and, and I would have to know more about you and uh, about what you enjoy doing, where you think your strengths are, et cetera, because both arenas can be very fulfilling as a, uh, in, in, for someone who wants to bring change. Both of them can be very frustrating, too. And, and I think what we've seen in this period that we're now emerging from, please God, is... <laughs> Is that uh, is, is is both in, in in business and in politics and in culture a distorted time horizon with uh, an inappropriate emphasis on um, you know short-term results, whether it's the next uh, quarterly earnings report. I mean, business as a lot of businesses have been making insane decisions. Because they're focused on that quarterly earnings report, sweeps weeks for media companies, overnight public opinion polls for for politicians and, and elected officials, and and the list goes on. So I I think that um, you know there are going to be problems and frustrations whichever arena you 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 enter, but they can both be fulfilling. But what what I hope is is happening, I believe is happening is we're now seeing the evolution of, uh, uh, of, of, a, of a better way of aligning incentives and goals with uh, what needs to be done in both, in both of those arenas. I, I wish you luck on it. Okay, over here. We only have time for one more. I'm cool. One more question. Really? Sorry, guys. Yeah, that's, thank you. Hello. Um, oh, come on. That's, uh, who's calling the shots here? <laughs> I'm not. I'm just, I'm just reading the monitor. I have a feeling that Al's going to miss a plane. Uh, Look, I, I'm okay, but the red dot is killing Well, let's ignore the red dot. Let's, of... let's, take, let's take a couple more. Hi, uh, Richard Kaiser with Sanford Bernstein. Thank you so much for taking the questions. Um, you, uh, more than anyone, know and understand just the size of the global warming problem and, and the clean energy problem. You listed some of the approaches, um, transmission, clean energy sources, the automobile. Uh, if the 300 million automobiles in the world and the average price globally is 50 thousand dollars that's 4.5 trillion just there so if you were going to as the current administration is approaching try to dedicate a hundred billion dollars which is just a small fraction of what is needed where would you start how would you how would you start prioritizing this is it solar is a residential solar where the u.s lags dramatically is it in the vehicle space is mm -hmm. it transmission okay if you were asked um, as the financial crisis unfolded on september 15th and Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and AIG and so forth, you only have $100 billion. What are you going to do? Y you would have said, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't that's, not, that's, that's, that's not going to work. You know, if you're Franklin Roosevelt and they bring you the news from Pearl Harbor and they say, you know, we're going to have to do something, but we only got $100 billion here, what, how are you going to prioritize it? Uh, look, I don't know how to communicate this effectively. I, I thank you for what you said about the, the, the keynote presentation and the movie and all that. I, I'm not saying this for effect. I feel as if I've failed badly because even though there's a greater sense of awareness due to many, a lot of things, including Mother Nature mainly, there is not yet anything close to a, a, an appropriate sense of urgency. This is, this is an existential threat. People don't, a lot of people don't reflect on what it means to have the North Polar ice cap disappear. In, uh, this, this summer in Iowa, all nine rivers were at the 500-year floodplain simultaneously. An F5 tornado stayed on the ground for 50 miles. Nothing in history has ever happened like that. Uh, the, every, each one meter increase in sea level causes 100 million climate refugees roaming the earth. And our political systems are, are kind of buckling and straining sometimes over the current stresses. Um, we can't limit it 
to $100 billion. And I, 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 I can't do it that way. I will say this, that the construction of a national unified smart grid would cost $400 billion over 10 years. And that compares to an annual cost to American business of $120 billion every year from unplanned outages and cascading failures as a result of the rickety hodgepodge of uh, old electricity systems that are sort of kludged together around the country. Now it's pitiful. It's pitiful. So that $400 billion investment in that element of it would, repay, would pay for itself in only three and a half years. Now, what is the, meanwhile, when you talk about cost, the annual cost of buying foreign oil and petroleum products from other countries last year was $328 billion. Every two years, it's roughly equal to the $700 billion bailout plan. $700 billion also is the cost of the Iraq war so far. And that mistake was driven in part, there were many factors involved, but in part, it was because Dick Cheney and others have long said, hey, we got to have military bases uh, in this area where the world's largest petroleum reserves are found, okay? We need a one-off investment to switch from an energy infrastructure that depends on dirty, dangerous, expensive uh, carbon-based fuels to a new energy infrastructure that, that runs on fuel that is free forever. The sun, the wind, the natural heat of the earth. It's not some pie in the sky. It is now. The Industrial Revolution was touched off in part by a perception in England that they were running out of trees. And the combination of the scientific revolution and the exploitation of coal led to this amazing scientific and technological and industrial revolution. The perception that we're running out of oil may or may not be correct. But, you know, three years after we had peak production in the U.S., we were vulnerable to the OPEC embargo. 35 years ago today, uh, Richard Nixon announced Project Independence three weeks after the oil embargo. We're not going to have any more dependence on foreign energy. Well, we were less than a third then, we're two-thirds now. But that was only three years after we reached our peak. We are either, we are at or near the peak of global oil production with any, in anything like this current price range now. And by the way, that means that at least as much is still in the ground as we have produced. But the downslope has very different economic characteristics than the upslope. And the new demand from China and India and et cetera, et cetera, is pushing that Phillips curve into a completely different region. And we would be fools not to make a transition to renewable energy. It is, and create jobs in the process, stimulate our economy, get this recession over with, and reduce our vulnerability in the national security dimension to this uh, foreign oil threat. Hi, I'm uh, Nicole Ferraro from InternetEvolution.com. I just want to know uh, what level of involvement you think the government should have in regulating the internet. <laughs> Uh, as little as possible, <laughs> as little as possible. There's some unavoidable uh, traffic cop uh, roles, but as little as possible. That's a good answer. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Coming from you, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, that means we have time for, oh, is it a fast question? Because it says the, red dot, the red dot the red is dot freaking is out. Very quick, no speeches. Hey, the red, the red dot is a very good symbol for what we're facing, right? What, what you've been talking about, right? The red dot is yelling at us. Yeah, right. Very, very, very quick. Uh, we're going rogue here. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Colleen Taylor, and uh, I want to ask you where the journalism profession fits into World 2.0 that you talk about. Um, Can you speak where, into the microphone? I'm, sure, sure. Where the journalism profession fits into World 2.0. Is there a place for the salaried staff reporter in a world of user-generated content and current TV, or is it a hobby? Absolutely. No, no. We have, look, uh, you know, we have a curated, uh, viewer-created content coupled with uh, vanguard journalism 
that is uh, really the, I, I mean, I, you're going to expect me to say or expect Joel Hyde to say it's the best stuff on television. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're very new. We won two Emmys last year. We have, uh, we won, you know, the, the, the people who make this vanguard journal, it's unbelievable. At a time when the Defense Department was saying there's no uh, uh, way of knowing if Osama bin Laden was in the cave at Tora Bora, uh, one of our vanguard journalists was in the cave with Pashtun interpreters. <laughs> uh, and they're, and they're, they're saying, well, here's where his dialysis machine was. You see this thing here? You know, this is the path that he walked to Pakistan on. You know, uh, really great <laughs> stuff. And, and I, I, mean, I can give you a long list. So I, I think that um, any medium or any uh, media company uh, in, the, in the Internet era has to strike some balance between the centrifugal forces and the centripetal forces. Where, where is that balance? We live, at current TV, we live every hour of every day right on that tightrope that marks the shifting boundary between the web and the television medium. It is so exciting to live there. We love that. And uh, the journalists who are on staff also love it. We get a lot of excitement, and we, you know, we exist to democratize the medium. But we also, you know, we'll come up with projects where lots of, where it'll be a combination of, of, uh, of staff, journalism, uh, journal, journalistic products, plus uh, crowdsourced uh, material. So uh, come talk to us. We, you know. That's the underlying purpose of your question. <laughs> All right. um, I thank you very much. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Al Gore. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.